<coughs> Hi folks, it's good to be with you. I uh, just want to make a quick video concerning um, the King James Bible and why we should read the King James Bible. And um, I'm not a King James only advocate. But I do believe that we need to go back to better Bible translations because of a couple of things. Number one, uh, in Muslim apologetics, um, you tend to find uh, that modern Bible translations, the Muslims are able to critique because the modern Bible translations have been watered down. Also, you, you'll find that um, Christian apologists are using modern Bible translations and there's a problem and the problem is that these modern Bible trans translations are based on bad uh, textual criticism. So this video is uh, to Jay Smith and to James White. I love these guys, they're great guys. I don't, I'm not criticizing their work generally, I'm not criticizing them, but it, it's to challenge them to think of a better way of defending the faith. So I'm going to show you, give you some evidence why we should read the King James Version rather than um, be using a lot of these modern translations, okay? So this is a paper by Phil, Dr. Phil Stringer, the West Gotten Hort only controversy, all right? So you can get the paper, Dr. Phil Stringer, the West Cotton Hort, only uh, controversy. Okay. He says, you don't have to read very much in contemporary fundamentalist Baptist literature to come across warnings about the King James only controversy. Dr. Jerry Falwell announces that he is a hireling. Dr. Harold Rawlins, to refute the King John Lee cultic movement that is damaging so many good churches today. So like I said, I'm not a King James only. I believe that, you know, uh, there can be good translations of the Bible. But, um, so just in case anybody says I'm King James only, because uh, I'm not. Now, it goes on here, the primacy of the King James Bible. God was doing a great work in England in the early 1600s, the preaching of the Gospel of Christ out of Matthew's Bible and the Geneva Bible was leading to multitudes of convergence. Evangelicals and Puritans were becoming a stronger and stronger force in the Church of England and in English culture. You may, yet many were concerned that the final translation work into the English language had not been done. King James was persuaded to authorise a new translation. The King James Bible was printed in 1611. At first, there were questions and concerns about this new Bible translation. This was as it should be. No one should accept the Bible translation lightly. By 1640, however, the King James Bible was clearly the Bible of the English people. The Geneva and, Ma and Matthew's Bible, once greatly used of God, went out of print, and there was simply no demand for them anymore. The Church of England, with its official evangelical doctrine statement, used the King James Bible exclusively. It was the Bible of the Puritans. It was the Bible of the uh, Puritans, both inside and outside the Church of England. In fact, the Puritans began to use the distinctive Bible, Biblical English of the King James Bible in their day to day speech. The King James Bible was the Bible of the Presbyterians, the Congregationalists, the Quakers, it was clearly the Bible of the Baptists. By 1640, it was the Bible of the Pilgrims. Some had used the Geneva Bible earlier. The King James Bible was the Bible of the Evangelicals in England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland. It became the Bible of the English colonies across the Atlantic Ocean. The only religious group of any size of importance in England that didn't use the King James Bible was the Roman Catholic Catholicism. All non-Catholics could have been referred to as King James only people. When the Methodist revival stirred England in the 1700s, it did so with the preaching of the King James Bible. John Wesley, one of the founders of Methodism, made his own translation of the New Testament. However, it found little acceptance even among Methodists 
all of the King James Bible was in common use. So we're seeing that the King James was used mightily in the English-speaking world. When English colonies flourished in Australia and New Zealand, the King James Bible was the common Bible of the settlers. When President George Washington took the first presidential oath of the office of the United States of America, he did so with his hand on the King James Bible. Every American president since, with the exception of Franklin Pierce, had done the same. Over 150 English translations were produced between 1611 and 1880. However, they found no audience except in a few cults. Most went out of print quickly. The English-speaking world was truly King James only. Baptist preachers produced a Baptist translation of the Bible. They replaced the word baptism with the word immersion. They replaced the word church with the word assembly. However, they found no audience, not even among Baptists. The translation was soon out of print. The Baptists were truly King James only. But here what we're seeing is the massive impact on the King James, uh, of the King James in our culture, how God used it. As it may be, as hard as it may be for the liberals and secularists to admit, the American public schools were built around the King James Bible. The Oxford's companion to the Supreme Court of the United States, not exactly a religious right publication, describes the early public schools this way. Public schools are distinctly Protestant flavour, with teachers leading prayers and scripture reading from the King James Bible in their lesson. The Roman Catholic minority objected to the King James Bible, and so they developed their own school system. With the exception of the, exception of the Catholics, the United States was clearly King James only. Russell Kirk, a Roman Catholic historian, describes the influence of the King James, King James Bible on the United States. The book that was to exert a stronger influence than any other in the America was not published until 1611. A few years after the first Virginia settlement, the King James translation of the Bible, the authorised version, was prepared by English scholars for King James. Read from American pub, read from American pulpits and in the great majority of American households during the colonial times. The authorised version shaped the style, informed the intellect, affected the laws and decrees, and the morals of the North American colonies. Truly the United States was King James only. According to Winston Churchill, 90 million copies of the King James Bible had been printed by the mid-20th century. The King James Bible was the Bible of the great modern mission movement of the 1100s and 1800s. The missionaries from England and the United States were saved, called to the mission field, and trained under the preaching of the King James Bible. They travelled around the world introducing the gospel of grace to millions. Many of these missionaries knew little or no Greek and Hebrew. They translated the Bible into 160 languages from the King James Bible. Truly, the modern missions movement was a King James-only movement. So... Again, all I'm, all I'm saying, I'm not saying King James only for myself, but what I am saying is look at the mighty blessing the King James has been used of God throughout our history and the history of our culture. Now, I want to just talk a few minutes about James White and Jay Smith and why I'm doing this video. In debate, uh, James White and Jay Smith, when they're debating Muslims, will say, oh, well, uh, we'll admit that things have been added in the Bible. And I believe this is a very dangerous thing to say and admit to Muslims because you might as well shoot yourself in your foot. But if you can show that Bible translation, a Bible translation is the word of God, that it's been preserved, that the text behind that translation has been preserved, then it's a stronger defence than saying things have been added to the Bible, like uh, Jay Smith and uh, James White have done in debates. Also, uh, modern Bible translations are watering down the gospel. Even in Liverpool, we have a gay Bible now where they're taking out bits of the Bible to suit the gay agenda. And we have a feminist Bible where they're taking bits out to suit the feminists. So it's important to get back to texts that are going to preserve the word of God so that we can read it in its purity rather than being tampered by modern scholarship. And then thirdly we have Bart Ehrman who um, is an American scholar has attacked the Bible on textual criticism. Now 
Many people might say, well, textual criticism, it's about scholasticism. It's not a relevant topic for me. But it is, because Bart Herman, American scholar, has sold uh, best-selling books on this issue of saying that there are problems with the Bible, that it's not been preserved textually. Uh, and Jay Smith and, and uh, James White are answering Muslim objections. Your average Muslim is aware of the textual issues of the Bible. So whether you like it or not as a Christian, it's something that you need to engage with because of the feminization of the Bible, the, the uh, gay lobby in trying to change the Bible, and then the Muslims challenging the Bible concerning textual criticism, Bart Ehrman challenging the Bible concerning textual criticism, and how we relate the Bible and, and prove its text, ancient text, to skeptics and Muslims, all right? So this is not an attack upon J. Smith or an attack on James White. I love these guys, I admire these guys. But what I'm trying to show you in a minute is what I showed you there is that the King James is a better Bible to use than many of the modern Bible translations. That's all I'm using that information for there, okay? That's the first point. And the second thing is, let's look now at why J. Smith and James White and Bart Ehrman uh, use a certain kind of textual criticism for modern Bible translations and why it, it undermines defending the faith and why they've tried to sideline the King James. All right? And once you grasp that, you'll have a better way of defending the faith. All right? So it all started in the 19th century with two scholars called Westcott and Hort. In the 1970s, a challenge arose in the English world to the primacy of the King James Bible. There had always been a challenge from Roman Catholicism, but this challenge came from men who were officially Protestants, Church of England bishops. Bishop Brooks Foss Westcott and Cambridge University Professor Fenton Anthony Hort. The heart of the Westcott and Hort theory was that the New Testament was preserved in almost perfect condition in two Greeks, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Sinaiticus was discovered in a wastebasket in St. Catherine's Monastery in 1844 by uh, Constantine von Tischendorf. The Vatican use was found in the Vatican Library in 1475 and was discovered in 1845. The King James New Testament was translated from different family of Greek texts. To Westcott and Hort, the King James Bible was clearly an inferior translation. It must be replaced by a new translation from the text that they considered to be the old and better. They believed that the true work of God in England had been held back by an inferior Bible. They determined to replace the King James Bible and the Greek Textus Receptus. In short, their theory suggested that for 1400 years, the preserved word of God was lost until it was recovered in the 19th century in a trash can and in the Vatican Library. Hort clearly had a bias against the Textus Receptus, calling it villainous and vile. Hort aggressively taught that the school at Antioch, associated with Lucian, had loosely translated the true text of Scripture in the 2nd century AD. This supposedly created an unreliable text of Scripture, which became the Textus Receptus. This was called the Lucian Recension Theory. Hort did not have a single historical reference to support. We'll stop there. Now here's the point. We have the King James Bible and it was used mightily in revivals and missions. And then in the 19th century we have these two bishops, uh, Westcott and Hall, and they found two ancient manuscripts and they said they were the older, they're older than the manuscripts that go with the King James. Right? And it's their ideas that are behind a lot of, of the modern scholarship today that James White, J. Smith and Bart Ehrman and many, many scholars today build on Westcott and Hall. Now what you need to know is in the 19th century it was the movement of higher criticism, criticism of the Bible and it was also the time of evolution when evolution began to take a grip. So it was a, a, a time when men were beginning to be critical of the Bible much more than they'd ever been. Whereas the King James was written in a time and translated in a time 
of men who, who really loved the Lord and loved the Word of God. So there was a, a difference, a big difference of time. And this affected uh, the new modern Bible translations that began to appear in the 19th century because of Wet Scott and Hall. Um, one writer says, W. Clark, the West Cotton Hawk text has become today our textus receptors. We have been freed from, from, the only, from the one and only to become captivated by the other. The psychological change so recently broken from our fathers have again been forged upon us even more strongly. So basically, the West Cotton Hawk text and the West Cotton Hawk theories of textual criticism basically became the mainstay for modern scholarship today. So when Bart Ehrman or when um, when um, James White or when J. Smith and J. Smith and James White are evangelical, Bart Ehrman is, is not evangelical, he's a, an agnostic scholar. When they say there have been bits added to the Bible, the evangelicals admitting it, thinking they're being intellectually honest, Bart Ehrman doing it because he wants to attack the Bible, they're basically using modern scholarship textual criticism based on Bar uh, based on Westcott and Hall. And these ideas were, were, came from sceptical critics. Okay, they were critics. They were not as orthodox as you as people think they are. So what you have to believe if you accept the Westcott and Hall theory, you have to believe that people who believed in the deity of Christ often cor corrupted Bible manuscripts. You have to believe that the people who denied the deity of Christ never corrupt Bible manuscripts. So what if you take on board these ideas of Westcott and Hawke, which modern scholarship built, you're basically saying those who believed in the deity of Christ were wrong. Those who believed in, 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 in the non-deity of Christ were right. Uh, you have to believe that people who died to get the gospel to the world couldn't be trusted with the Bible. You have to believe that the killers will be trusted. So those who persecuted the church, what, what Westcott and Hort are saying, which people don't realise, is those who persecuted the church, their text are the right text. Those who died for the faith and defended the te a text, they they are, got it wrong. Okay? So... Even though many evangelical street Westcott and Hawk theory has proven fact, there have always been serious uh, textual scholars that challenged it. The brilliant textual scholar Dean John Bergen referred to Westcott and Hawk's violent recall from the traditional text and their absolute contempt for the traditional text. He refers to the theory as superstitious veneration of a few ancient documents. So Dean Bergen, John Bergen, was a world authority at the time of the 19th century in textual criticism. And basically, he's saying that these Westcott and Hall had a massive agenda to attack the received text of the King James. F. E. Scrivener wrote, Dr. Hall's system, therefore, is entirely destitute of historical foundation. He does, he does not so much as make a show of pretending to it, but then he would persuade us as he persuaded himself. So, two great scholars of textual criticism in the 19th century basically was saying that Westcott and Hort's ideas were just a load of rubbish, but they were ignored. Scrivener and Dean Bergen were ignored and the world went with Westcott and Hort. And our modern Bible translations are built on Westcott and Hort. B.F. Westcott was born in 1825 and F.J. Hort was born in 1828. They were members of the board of the High Church Party of the Church of England. They became friends during their student days in Cambridge University. They worked for over 30 years together on the subject of the Greek text of the New Testament. Westcott went on to become the Bishop of Durham and served for a while as a chaplain to the Queen Victoria, or is best remembered as a Professor of Divinity at Cambridge University. Both men wrote several books. They are both remembered for their edition of the New Greek New Testament entitled The New Testament of the Original Greek. They are also remembered for... Uh, being the two most influential members of the English Revised Version Committee which produced a new English translation, Scrivener thought that they exercised too much influence on this committee. Westcott died in 1901. He, Hort passed away in 1892. Both men had sons who collected their personal correspondence 
and who wrote biographies of them. So now we're going to see that these men who were the foundation of modern scholarship that James White, J. Smith, many modern Bible translations and critics like Bart Ehrman are imbibed the West Cotton Hort theories of textual criticism. Now we're going to see the doctrinal views of these men who made the foundation for our modern Bible translations. And it shows you why we need to go back to the King James and use scholarship that's rooted in that, in that textual tradition. Scripture. It is clear that neither Westcott nor Hort held anything even faintly as resembling a conservative view of Scripture. According to Hort's son, Dr. Hort's own mother, a devout Bible believer, could not be sympathetic to his views about the Bible. Westcott wrote to Hort that overwhelmingly rejected the idea of the infallibility of the Bible. Hort says the same thing the same week in a letter to the Bishop Lightfoot. When Westcott became Bishop of Durham, the Durham University Journal welcomed him with the prayers that he was free from all verb verbal mechanical ideas of inspiration. Salvation. Hawke called the doctrine of substitutionary atonement immoral. In doing so, he sided with the normal doctrine of the High Church Party of the Church of England. The Low Church Party was generally evangelical, teaching salvation through personal faith in Jesus Christ. The High Church Party taught salvation by good works, including baptism and church membership. Westcott and Hawke wrote many commentaries that included reference to classic passages about salvation, repeated Repeatedly, the commentary is vague and unclear. Westcott taught the idea of propitiation God was to the New Test was foreign to the New Testament. He taught that salvation came from changing the character of the one who offended God. This is consistent with his statement that a Christian is never, never is, but is always becoming a Christian. Again and again, Westcott's vague comments about salvation are easy to interpret as teaching universal salvation. The Doctrine of Christ. In the common days of Westcott and Hort, for those in the Church of England who died the deity of Christ to speak in vague terms, to, clear, uh, to clearly deny the deity of Christ was jeopardised your position in the Church of England. Many high church modernists learned to speak of the deity of Christ in unclear terms as a way to avoid trouble. Many statements by both Westcott and Hort fall into the category of fuzzy doctrinal statements about Christ. Westcott and Hawke were brilliant scholars. Surely they were capable of, it, capable of expressing themselves clearly on the doctrine of Christ if they wanted to. At best, they are unclear. At worst, they are modernist, hiding behind the fundamental doctrinal statements of the Church of England. Other teachings of Westcott and Hawke. There are many other areas of the cause of fundamental by believers to have serious questions about Westcott and Hawke. Wesker and Hort denied the Genesis 1 and 3 were historically true. Hort praised Darwin and his theory of evolution. Both Wesker and Hort praised the Christian socialist movement of their day. And they were heavily into uh, rationalist philosophers like Samuel Taylor Coldridge. Where Wesker and Hort said, man, there's very little information concerning a conversion. We can't find hardly anything. And they, all, and they attack evangelists such as people like D.L. Moody. And the soul winning Methodists. So they, they attack these Methodists and people like D.L. Moody. Now the work of the Revision Committee. Westcott and Hall were involved in revising the King James now. And this is where it comes in. So we're seeing that they, they weren't theologically sound. And now they're in charge of doing a, a new, getting rid of the King James and doing a new Bible translation. And this is going to influence all the modern scholarship that we see today. All right. In 1870, the English Parliament authorised a revised revision of the King James Bible. Two teams of translators were hired. Most translators were from the Church of England, but there were also seven Presbyterians, four Congregationalists, two Baptist, Methodist, and one Unitarian. So on this committee, there was a Unitarian, and West, uh, Hort lobbied much to keep this Unitarian on the committee. So that shows you the Unitarians don't believe in the deity of Christ. So this shows you how bad the foundation was. And on this committee, Westcott and Hort bullied every other scholar, and they got their way, so their theories held sway. 
to the point where Samuel Wilberforce resigned after referring to the project as this most miserable business. Next, were Westcott and all secret practitioners of the occult? Uh, there have been accusations uh, against them, so what information do we have? Uh, we'll read it in full. In 1993, Gail uh, Ripplinger published a New Age Bible version. In this book, she alleges that Westcott and Hoare were practitioners of the cult. It is indicated that they provided a bridge between apostate Christianity and the occult and the New Age. This, this charge created a sensation and generated a tremendous amount of criticism for Mrs. Ripplinger. It is, of course, a very important charge, and an objective look at the evidence for such a charge is important. Along with the Bishop Edward White Benson, Westcott and Hort founded the Ghostly Guild. This club was designed to investigate ghost and supernatural appearances. So these bishops started the Ghostly Guild, okay? According to the Encyclopedia of Occultism and Parapsychology, the members of the Ghostly Club would relate personal experiences concerned with ghosts. This club would eventually become the Society for Psychiat Psychical Research, according to James Webb in the Occult Underground and W. H. Salter. The SPR, an outline of its history, this club became a major factor in the rise of spiritualism among the elite of English society in the late 1800s. Many leading occult figures belonged to the society. So these bishops formed this club that was influential in spiraling spiritualism in the 1800s. Along the way, Westcott and Hall dropped out of the ghostly guild. However, they had plenty of opportunity to be, to be exposed to the occult and de demonism before they withdrew. Westcott's son refers to his father's life, long faith in spiritualism. Archbishop Benson's son referred to Benson in the same way. Communion with the spirits became quite fashionable in the late 1800s in British society. Even Queen Victoria, who normally led a responsible Christian life, dabbled in spiritualism. However, it was considered unseemly for Church of England clergymen, and Westcott had to keep his ideas quiet. According to Westcott's son, Arthur D. Westcott practiced the communion of the saints. This was a belief that you can have fellowship with the spirits of those who died. Bible translator G.B. Phillips also believed in the communion of saints, and he believed that the spirit of C.S. Lewis visited him after his death. According to Arthur Westcott, Bishop Westcott also had such experiences with spirits. His son writes, The communion of saints seems particularly associated with Peterborough. He had an extraordinary power of realising this communion. It was his delight to be alone at night in the great cathedral, for there he could meditate and pray in full sympathy with all that was good and great in the past. There he always had abundant company. Westcott's daughters met him returning from one of his customary meditations, in the solitary darkness of the chapel at Auckland Castle, she said to him, I expect you do not feel alone. Oh no, he said, it's full. Either Dr. Westcott's children lied about him, or Dr. Westcott was used to meet him with the spirits. Bible believers recognised these spirits as demons. Westcott and Hope both joined a secret society called the Apostles. It was limited to 12 members. One of the other members was Henry Sidgwick. He was also stated to have led several professors at Trinity College into secretly practising the occult. Westcott, his close friend, was also a professor at Trinity College, strange company for a, crane, for a Christian teacher and Bible translator. In 1872, Westcott formed a secret society that Arana's club members included Hawke, Sidgwick, Arthur Balford, future Prime Minister of England, Archbishop Trench and Dean Alford, both Trench and Alford would be involved in Bible revision work. Balfour became famous for his seances and practice of spiritualism. The Rana's Club would eventually become known as a cult secret society. Westcott's defenders point out that Westcott also eventually dropped out of the Rana's. Still, he was certainly allied with practitioners of the occult in a secret society for a period of time. Balfour and Sidgwick, Sidgwick were involved in several occult organisations, socialism and theof theosophy, theosophy. How many Christians have so many friends prominent in the practice of the occult? 
So basically these guys, Westcott and Hall, are involved in these secret societies of of occultism. Um they they've got certain ideas about text that we're gonna get onto and they basically bullied this committee to accept their ideas and I'm I'm just gonna talk about their ideas. Basically, uh, the argument is that Westcott and Hall, these manuscripts, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, these are older than what we have in the King James, like the Textus Receptus for the New Testament, the Byzantine text. And so basically, um, they're saying, Westcott and Hall were saying that these are older, so we've got to use them. But the problem is, they were, they were even though they were older, they were inferior text. There's all sorts of uh, textual variants and there were texts that that um, that that were inferior that was not as orthodox in their copying you know they come from the Alexandrian school and Westcott and Hort said the Antioch school were not very good at copying it was actually the other way around the Alexandria school were not good at copying the Antioch school was good at copying and the Antioch school where they were accurate in their copying and orthodox is where the Byzantine text come from, which is behind the King James Version, the Textus Receptus. Whereas the modern Bible translations come from the Alexandrian school, which they were notorious for not copying very well, and the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are behind that. So even though these manuscripts are the oldest, they are not the best, all right? But the the other thing as well is the reason why we don't have as many... So, Westcott and Hort said that even though we've got 5,000 Byzantian texts, which are from the 11th, 10th, 12th, 13th century AD, right? Which are behind the Textus Receptus. Even though we've got 5,000 of them, we got two of Westcott and Hort. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. So Westcott and Hort said these two, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, are equal to one. So it was two against one, but it wasn't. It was two against five thousand. But modern scholarship went with their ideas. Right, it's two against one. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus against the Textus Receptus. Two against one. And that's how modern scholarship developed with these ideas. But the reality was, it was two against 5,000. And why haven't we got as many early manuscripts of the Byzantine? Because it was used, and when you use text, they disintegrate. So this was the line, that this was the orthodox line, because these manuscripts got used and they disintegrate. We have these older texts because they weren't used by the early church much. They were, not, they were seen as not very good texts. That's why we have them. All right? We don't have as many of the from the Byzantium going back earlier because of the use of them, all right? And it was these theories of Westcott and Hall that that gained prominence in twentieth century and are prominent today in modern scholarship. So when you get your King James Bible, for example, you will have the woman committing adultery in it. And you'll have the last ending of Mark. But in your modern translations, they put notes and say it's not in the Bible. So when you're talking to a Muslim, they'll say there's bits been added to the Bible. The woman committing adultery and the last ending of Mark. And modern scholars in their Bible translations will say that this is the case. But your King James has it in. All right? Why? Because it comes from the Byzantine school, the Byzantine text. They can be traced right back to the early church as being accurate in their copying. Whereas these modern translations, which go to the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, are from a very uh, weak tradition of copying. All right? So there are people who said, well, all this attacking Westcott, saying that they were liberal scholars, it's not fair, read their books, read their, do uh, read their commentaries, read their doctrinal books they were orthodox 
and all this attack that they were into a cult is it's not fair, it's not right. Well, you can go and read their material. I've read their material. I've read some of the work. And um, they do, when you read their material, come across as orthodox. But uh, to be fair, you know, if you, if you read some of their material... Um, but there are letters, there's documents, there's information, and even in the doctrinal and commentaries, uh, you'll find that there are hints that show that they were as orthodox as they make themselves out to be. Uh, there are letters, I think, of Westcott, where he talks about spiritism. Um, there are documents like that around. Um, and bishops were very, very careful, if they were orthodox, not to give the game of the way. So, so they, they were fuzzy on certain doctrines rather than deny them, otherwise they'd have been kicked out of the church. So even though they're denying them, they cover it up by being fuzzy in their statements. All right? So I'm being intellectually honest and fair, having, some, having been someone who's read some of the materials, but specifically Westcott. I've, I've seen his work on the resurrection. I've seen his work on the Gospel of John. And I, I have seen some of his letters and stuff. So basically what I'm saying is the, the writer of this article, I would say is correct when he's making the accusations against Westcott and Hall. Having looked at the material uh, in the past myself, Okay. So we come to the conclusion. Dean Bergen was a contemporary and acquaintance of both Westcott and Hall. He was a firm opponent of the Westcott and Hall theory, the new Greek text and the revision of the English Bible that they had so heavily influenced it. In an article entitled The Secret Spanking of Westcott and Hall, Bergen wrote, the text of Dr. Westcott and Hall is either the very best which has ever appeared or else it is the very worst. The nearest to the sacred autographs or the furthest from them. There is no room for both opinions and there cannot exist any middle view. In other words, things that are different are not the same. Millions of professing evangelicals have never heard of Westcott and Hall. Nonetheless, their approach to the scripture is based upon the theory of Westcott and Hall. Westcott and Hall, only, only, no matter how many books, professors, colleges or denomination, denominational leaders these theories are filtered through, they are still the work of Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort are not a sufficient basis to reject the Textus Receptus or the King James Bible. Their objectivity, scholarship and doctrine are at best suspect. There is no reason to believe that they were saved men. There is more reason to believe that they were influenced by the occult than there is to believe that they were influenced by the Holy Spirit. So, I'm going to finish here. My challenge to Jay Smith, and my challenge to uh, Bart Ehrman, and my challenge to James White is to to respond if you if you would like to respond with the paper from all three of you refuting this paper which is by Dr Phil Stringer so you can write a paper refuting this paper okay uh, and basically my contention is that when we're doing Muslim evangelism that we need to use literal translations and we need to use the King James or translations that are based on the text that they advocated, that it advocated. Because the Byzantian uh, New Testament texts are better than the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Okay. And um, God's word has been preserved. The other thing as well is my position is stronger because I'm going off the Westminster Confession and what the Bible teaches about preservation that, that the Word of God has been preserved so there must be somewhere manuscripts and copies of manuscripts where the Word of God has been preserved 
And I believe it's in the King James tradition of that translation and the work that the King James scholars were doing. I believe it's that school of translators and scholars that are much better served to, to be a blessing to us today than the modern scholarship that has followed Westcott and Hall. And that's my challenge. Uh, so when we're talking to Muslims, we don't have to say the woman committed adultery has been added or the last ending of Mark has been added and corrupted the text, like James White King and, and James Smith have admitted sometimes in debates in the past, although uh, people are beginning to change. James Smith might be changing a little bit on the woman committing adultery as new evidence comes to light. But there have been in debates where they've admitted in debates that that there have been text added to the text, uh, extra parts added to the text, which is basically, you're basically saying, without realising it, the text has been corrupted. And and so my challenge is, is to say no, to challenge Jay Smith, to challenge uh, James White and say, no, you... you that is not a good way to debate. That's not a good way to be in debate when you're debating Muslims. You're doing great harm when you're doing that. And then my challenge to Bart Ehrman is, my challenge to him and his textual attack upon the Bible is to say, prove to us that your attack upon the Bible is objective scholarship. Give us absolute proof and evidence that your scholarship is not based on West Scott and Hall, that it's independent and that it's scholarship that uh, can stand the scrutiny of objective scholarship. And the second question would be to Bart Ehrman is, can you really have a fully objective scholarship when our presuppositions are involved in our scholarship? And, you know, my third question would be, what presuppositions are involved in your textual critical, critical scholarship. And that presupposition will primarily undermine the authority and inspiration of the Bible. Um, so those are my questions to James White, to Jay Smith and to Bart Ehrman. I don't equate Bart Ehrman on the same level in terms of doctrine with James White or Jay Smith. I regard these as orthodox men, as good men, solid men in the faith. Don't disagree with them on many, many things. But I do equate them together following Bart Ehrman and these guys, following modern theories of textual criticism that are really subjective and built on Westcott and Hall. And this article and the thoughts that I've given you basically absolutely destroy, dismantle, show you that building you build that modern scholarship is built on a wrong foundation in textual criticism now i don't offer this as a definitive lecture uh, this is just a a general uh, caveat a general um joust you know but if these guys wanted to challenge me to debate or get involved in discussion with them I'd have to go and do some more research and, and produce some uh, some even more, much more uh, solid material. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't want people to come across as this is the final say on the issue or that this is like definitive scholarship. I am just putting this out as a little joust to show people that there's a better way of thinking then it's up to other scholars like this scholar and many others like Dr. Phil Stringer and many others to, to, con to contend with these other scholars and to bring the scholarship. If people want me to get into the debate and, and think of me, then it would take a long time to do the, to do the in-depth research. I can read this and I know from years ago I've read documents that this guy is mentioning. I've read some of the documents so I can verify from years ago that what this man has written is is, is accurate okay so I, I I've had an interest in Westcott and I ha I've had some of his books and I've looked at some of his work uh, etc so there we are so my 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 
conclusion is with the gay pride movement there's a bible translation in um, Liverpool where there is called the gay bible where they're watering down the bible we have the new NIV has come out where they're making it more feminist um, and so you've got to be aware these modern bible translations are watering down the word of God so getting back to the King James I'm not saying King James only because there can be other bible translations that could be done better if God raised up great scholars who knows so I'm not just saying King James only uh, you've got William Tyndale which is King James is based a lot on William Tyndale's ideas. So I'm not saying King James only, but um, getting back to reading the King James, getting back to using it again, uh, studying it again, because then you're going to preserve the doctrines. They're not going to get watered down. All right. And then, you know, uh, when it comes to Muslim evangelism, and they say, oh, uh, the woman adultery has been added, or or uh, the last bit mark has been added, it's been corrupted. And they show the NIV different from the King James. Well, you can give an argument and say, well, I don't agree with this modern scholarship potential criticism. I go with this other uh, uh, textual criticism that's behind the King James that can be traced back to scholars like Dean Bergen. And, uh, you know, I can say that the Word of God has been preserved. Uh, we have a better textual tradition. Um, so you can defend yourself better. In debates, when you debate Muslim academics, you can defend yourself better. You don't have to say, last ending of Mark has been added. You can say, no, it's in the text. All right? And when you're dealing with critics like Bart Ehrman, you can realise that when he's attacking the Bible, he's coming at it from a biased perspective. He's built on Westcott and Hall. And Westcott and Hall were biased. They were, they were against Orthodox Christianity and wanted to undermine it. They had a, a bias. They were they were into the occult. They they were encouraged Unitarian, a, a Unitarian scholar. They had uh, subjective theories about Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, and they had an agenda to to overturn the King James, in its textual tradition. And uh, so it was not as objective. And they were bullies in the committee that they were doing in the revised version. So, it, 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 you know, you can, you can see that, you know, a lot of the Bibles today are built on translations, are not built on good foundations. And you're better going back to the King James and going back to a better textual tradition. All right, those are my thoughts. Take it or leave it. Um, so yeah, so my website is jasonburnspreacher.com and you can, um, Dr. Phil Stringer is the article and uh, the Westcott and Hort only controversy, okay? And the title of this video, I'm gonna call it uh, Jay Smith, James White and Bart Ehrman refuted. Uh, the problem with modern Bible translations. All right, God bless you. Love to everybody and hope this has been a blessing. All right, the reason why I've done this is I just think it's important. I know many people will think it's scholastic and I don't like to mention names. But I think things are just getting so bad with the Muslims arising up in the West. They're attacking the Bible on textual criticism. Uh, evangelical scholars conceding ground where they don't need to and then we've got critics like Bart Ehrman attacking and I, and I think it's the, the, this video is just a small contribution to a robust challenge to these movements at this present time and also the subtle watering down of modern Bible translations watering down the word of God I th this video helps to start to move the goalpost to, to, to get debate and discussion and to challenge people to go a different direction. Many people will think this is esoteric, it's scholastic, it's, it's not worth thinking about. But m maybe some of you will see the need to start reading your King James. Alright? God bless you. Your King James Bible. 
My website is jasonbirdspreacher.com. God bless everybody and love to everybody. God bless you.